So good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Top Tog guest photography session. Hi, Jacob. I know you're in the wings. How are you doing? I'm not too bad, thanks, Jay. How are you? I'm very good, thanks. So it's uh, it's been good to catch up with you today and have a bit of an insight in what we're going to be talking about. Uh, but just before we get into it, Jacob, um, just for people who might not have heard of you before or not familiar with you, um, familiar with you, just tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey into photography and sort of where you got to today. All right, okay. Um, so I head up Danish Apple Photography, which is a husband and wife outfit. Um, myself and my wife Dasha have been shooting together professionally for about, uh, I think this is the end of our sixth year now. Um, prior to that, I just had it, to be honest with you, as a hobby. Um, but what I found with the wedding photography, as everyone knows, it can be quite demanding. Um, so we branched out. We did a lot of we do a lot of corporate stuff now as well. Um, and then here and there, I do a lot of personal projects. So what I'm going to be talking about today is actually more of a personal project, and I'll talk more about why I do that. Um, but that's working with models and stuff, which is something that I only recently started doing, maybe in the last couple of years or so. Up until then, it was very much just run into a wedding and not quite hope for the best. You know, you build up your talents and your skill set and your equipment. Um, but I didn't really have any sort of vision as to where I wanted to go with my photography. And talking today is kind of about that in, in part, really. Um, more recently, I've become uh, a creative pro with Interfit Photographic. So uh, you'll often see me talking at places like the SWPP, but also at the photography show at Birmingham NEC, that kind of thing. Just generally uh, helping people understand lighting in general. I always say light is light, no matter what produces it. Um, but so, yeah, that's me in a nutshell, really. That's brilliant. And I think the importance as much as we're looking, you know, specifically tonight about obviously your experiences with, you know, taking shoots abroad and the practicalities of it. But I think you touched on a really important bit there where you're saying about obviously it stemmed from your personal projects. And I think it's so important. We talk about it a lot here at the Academy that it's important. That it's so easy to get trapped into what you do every day. And it's it's so important to push yourself learn more and get creative and usually find then that it actually you, 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 I don't know, I guess, you, I guess you feel the same, but then it starts to not bleed, but then it starts to come into your day-to-day -day processes as well and becomes more interesting and exciting. Do you think I'm right? You know, I'm, I'm on t ticking the right boxes there, mate. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the, <clears throat> what I found, as I say, is I kind of almost got stuck in a rut, if you will. And, um, I started doing just a personal project. Funnily enough, it was a friend that convinced me to come along to a shoot that uh, she was taking part in. And from that, I realized that I could learn so much just by doing something for myself rather than just for other people. Perfect. Brilliant. Well, we're going to talk a bit more, a bit more uh, after the presentation about what you're doing in January at the convention. Um, obviously, I've shared the links with people and how they can interact with you uh, on the screen, but I'll be sending them the information for that via the chat panel. And every, all the things we talk about tonight with you guys, uh, you will be getting a follow-up email uh, from me tomorrow uh, with the links for Jacob and, uh, of course, his masterclass at the convention and anything that we talk about here tonight. So, Jacob, I'm not going to waste any time because I want to get into the presentation. So I'm going to hand you the screen, pal. Okay, so um, basically this talk is uh, a little bit more about how you plan a shoot than it is an actual shoot, but what I am going to be referring to throughout and all the pictures, that, all the images that you'll see um, are from a shoot I did uh, in Rome a couple of years ago, last year actually, um, and it was rather than being one single shoot, it was actually several shoots over the course of about five days. Um, I'll talk more about that as we go on. So without further ado... So why shoot abroad? Uh, when why shoot at all? Um, Jay already touched on it uh, in our intro session or intro bit there about the idea behind shooting personal projects is that it gives you a great opportunity to challenge yourself. Um, you can take risks without worrying about making mistakes. You know, you will, as you shoot, you will make mistakes and you'll correct them. Weddings are a good example just because if you shoot in manual, you invariably find a shot going on right behind you where you turn around and the camera settings are wrong. You take the shot and you find that you're probably going to have to use a bit of Lightroom editing to adjust the exposure. Um, the other thing is, of course, flashes fail, uh, equipment falls apart. This doesn't happen a lot and it doesn't happen very often. But if you put yourself in a challenging position, then 
you will come up against those kind of stresses. Now, if you challenge yourself with a personal project, then you're putting yourself in that position without the risk of annoying a paying client and without embarrassing yourself because the only client in this is yourself you're shooting to make you happy um, and you know if you get models on board or friends that come along or anything like that it doesn't matter if things go wrong because they don't know what your vision is and actually they're just there to help you out so what i always say is that forcing yourself oh sorry forcing yourself into that uh, stressful challenging situation allows you to then be better equipped for when it happens in the real world where somebody is paying for you. Um, the how is quite simple really. You need to decide on a vision. You need to decide on what is it you're gonna take away from this shoot. When you plan to go somewhere, particularly as we did to Rome, you don't wanna be spending a, a lot of money on models and travel and potentially new kit. Um, you know, entrance fees to locations, that kind of thing, without at least having some idea as to what it is you want to get out of it. Uh, call it a vision if you want, call it an end result, doesn't really matter, but just always have in mind that you're doing this for a reason and have that very clearly in mind because even when things go wrong, if you know why you're doing it, you'll be able to deal with it better. Um, in terms of how you choose a particular location, well, you know, you decide on, are you gonna go somewhere that's really out there? Or are you gonna go somewhere that's local that you know, like the back of your hand? Well, going somewhere further afield is probably gonna be more challenging. But equally, if you go somewhere that you've already shot before, then the challenge becomes, okay, I've been here before, how do I do it differently? You know, change light setups, maybe turn around and shoot behind you rather than the obvious choices, that kind of thing. In terms of where to look, I mean, Google, other search engines are available. <laughs> um, but Pinterest is another great source of inspiration. People put up mood boards all the time on Pinterest. Personally, um, Dasha and I actually have uh, shared photo streams. Uh, we both use uh, iPhones and you can share your, your photos like almost like a photo album that you can then give each other access to. And so we both attach photos to that when we see stuff. It might be a cool lighting pattern, um, and it might even be, I saw a concert uh, on TV, and I love the way the lighting was hitting the model, uh, sorry, the singer, and I thought this would be really cool and something that I'd like to replicate at some point when I go out shooting with models, which I could then bring into my wedding photography later on, and I have actually done that in the past. Um, it also gives us the option of sharing ideas about outfits um, and what we may like the idea of shooting so this image is a good example i had never done sort of this sort of grungy fashion high street kind of shot i've seen something similar countless times and i thought this is something i want to do um, the only other thing really is talk to other people because they might give you ideas that you hadn't even thought about um, and as it happens I will show a few shots from a place called Ostia Antica, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but that was a very, very last minute thing that maybe a week before we headed off got added to our plans. So as far as that's concerned, we had three goals in mind when we planned this shoot. Dasha and I had visited Rome the year before and we absolutely loved it. So number one, we wanted to go back to Rome to eat lots of ice cream. Number two, we wanted to take some amazing bridal images. Yes, I could have gone with bride and groom. In the end, we went with two female models because I'm comfortable with shooting couples. I'm comfortable with shooting um, the males. I wasn't as comfortable with directing females. And so I thought if I get two female models with me, then I can build on that. And then finally, try something new. I do a lot of wedding photography. I do a lot of corporate stuff don't do much else, or at least at this stage in my career, I wasn't doing much else, so I switched it up to do that as well. In terms of models, there's a whole heap of ways that you can find models. The first thing you really wanna think about is, do you work with models local to where you're planning on shooting, who obviously have the benefit of, well, hopefully, knowing the area, knowing good locations that might be hidden away otherwise, and speaking the language. Now, I don't speak Italian, I wish I did, 
Um, I can say spaghetti and that's about it. <laughs> um, but the downside is that if you haven't worked with them before, it might take you longer to, to gel with those models. Whereas models that you've worked with before, you can get into the groove a lot quicker. You can focus on improving your skill set, on doing that daring stuff, because the models know, look, I know that you can take a good shot, even if this initial set of images that we're doing isn't quite looking right, or it doesn't feel right, I know that it's gonna come, in, come into its own over time and we can build up. So there are, you know, good points for and against. I decided to opt for models that I knew because I knew their style, they knew my style. Um, it meant that we could very quickly move away from that, uh, but it also meant that we had, for, for both us uh, as photographers and them as models, we had a, an easy go-to if we found we were starting to struggle a little bit. Where do you look? Well, we use Purple Port. Um, there's Model Mayhem, there's Model Kartai, uh, there's Star Now, there's Mad Cow Models, there's Pure Storm. You've got Facebook groups. There's millions of places to find models. Search for models online and you'll find them. Um, actually, as it happens, these two models, as I say, were models that I'd worked with before, so I didn't need to go searching. But I did, I did spend the time looking for models in Rome to see if there was anyone that I thought I might work quite well with and who would fit the bill for what I wanted to do. Um, in the end, as I say, I opted for models that I'd worked with before. One thing to think about, please, please, please be nice to your models. Um, if you're going abroad, if you're going far away from home, if the models haven't done it before, they might even say no. But if you offer them the opportunity to have chaperones with them or a guest or a, a plus one, um, obviously we didn't pay for the plus ones, but we did offer the models the opportunity if they wanted to have a plus one with them, they could do. Um, and then finally, obviously, if you're using more than one model, be sure to allocate your time generously between them. We had two models. Um, I made sure that we alternated who we shot with first at every location that we went to. I made sure that we spent roughly equal amount of time with each model, which also gave them a bit more downtime. Because happy models equals hardworking models equals better photos. This shot is actually taken at Ostia Antica, as is the next slide. So this shot is um, from this place called Ostia Antica. I'll tell you a little bit about it now. I was going to come on to it later, but I will talk a little bit about it. Ostia Antica is um, a very, very old Roman port town serving the old Roman Empire. Uh, and it was lost, covered in silt um, for however many hundreds of years until quite recently in the last century or so it was uncovered and dug back up and a bit like you have um, Pompeii which is all covered in the volcanic ash and, and so on. This is similar in that it's really well preserved uh, where they uncovered it. I mean uh, some of the flooring and walkways and stuff still have the original mosaic tiles with the colours still visible. It's quite a phenomenal place to go. This particular shot gives you a good example of where working with an experienced model that or when I say experienced a model that you've worked with before is quite good because I was really far away from her this was zoomed in at 200 mil and um, it would have been difficult to communicate with this is Chrissy in this shot it would have been difficult to communicate with her what exactly is I wanted her to do once I'd moved to where I was shooting from so realistically I had to accept that if I didn't say to her in advance and she didn't get where I was trying to go with it, we weren't going to get the shot. So a good example of why working with someone you're familiar with is a good idea. This is Rasheen, the other model that we worked with. So let's talk a little bit more about locations. I've already talked about uh, where you can find them. One thing I haven't talked about is you need to think about permissions. Certain locations will prohibit any type of photography, particularly uh, if you're looking at boosting your wedding photography skills or online portfolio or anything like that, um, churches can be very restrictive. But also some venues are fine with you doing photography, but not for commercial use. And then you've got others still that 
they won't restrict you from doing any kind of photography, but they will restrict what kind of gear you can take with you or use, tripods in particular, or use of flash. You know, um, these kinds of things you need to think about and actually researching in advance can be <laughs> really helpful in sorting out the issues when you actually get there and it wasn't quite like you planned. Um, a thing to think about as well is uh, when you're sorting, sourcing locations, there may be additional costs, you know, entry fees, um, or potentially if you find a willing venue, they might be happy for you to use the venue to shoot at in exchange for them getting photos. I actually did do a styled wedding shoot. Um, well, it wasn't styled wedding shoot per se, it was a styled wedding cake shoot. Um, and it was at a venue nearby, which in exchange for them allowing us to use the venue to do the setup of the cake and everything like that, they asked for us to take some photos of various items that they were looking to rent out to wedding couples for the, uh, those that hosted at, at their at their venue. So in exchange for not having to pay a fee, we offered them these photos instead. Some venues, not when we went to Rome, but the, the talk that I'm going to be doing in January at the SWPP um, was based at a particular venue that did have very specific outfit requirements. You know, it's not something that you necessarily think about. You just think, well, I'm going to get a gorgeous bride. I'm going to shove her in a gorgeous wedding dress and I'm going to shove her right in front of camera. And I'm going to take the most amazing photos. And I say shove, but let's face it, you're putting them nicely, right? But no matter how nicely you put them there, some venues will not allow you because there's too much, perhaps too much flesh on display. Again, if it's a sacred site, they might not like the idea of, well, as in this case, shoulders being visible or the idea that this model may be naked, which she's not, as you'll see in a second. But that sort of thing you have to be aware of and you won't know unless you check in advance. So this is a pulled out shot of that same same location as the previous shot. This isn't that Ostia Antica, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about Ostia Antica because here's one of the pitfalls that you might come across. We found out, as I say, about Ostia Antica about, I don't know, about a week before we went off, maybe a week and a half, if I give it uh, a conservative estimate. But uh, I knew that this could be quite a phenomenal location and I really wanted to go there. So I made sure to check the website to see if the website said anything about photography. And there wasn't very much on there. It said that you can do photography. That's absolutely fine. Um, I phoned them in advance and although they only spoke broken English, we got uh, clarity and it was absolutely clear to me that no, absolutely fine to go and photograph, don't have to ask for permission, uh, you can just go in, just take your camera with you and yep, take models with you, absolutely fine. We turn up on the day with our two models in tow, all nicely dressed up. And the driver trying to do us a favor, we that's another thing, we'd booked a taxi, of course, to get us there. Um, the driver uh, goes up to the entrance, the guy at the entrance and says, oh, you know, these guys are just here doing a bit of shooting. Um, you know, and he was trying to do us a favor. He was trying to get us in for free. Bear in mind, the entrance fee wasn't more than maybe five, six euros. It wasn't an awful lot of money. But as soon as they heard photographer, they were like, no way. There ain't no way, not only are you not getting in, you're not shooting, nothing like that. And not only can you not pay, but you would have to get the license to, to get in several months in advance and pay, obviously. Um, so we get pulled over, or rather I get pulled over into this ramshackle little shed that is by the entrance and with uh, three or four burly security guards, one standing right over me, I kid you not and looking very aggressive and I'm there and of course one thing to bear in mind is don't have all your camera equipment on show. I had my camera, I had a 14 to 24 mil lens so not a, a massive uh, invasive telephoto 70 to 200 kind of lens. It was still a decent camera and a decent lens but you know this is something that the average amateur can quite happily or hobbyist can afford and doesn't have to worry too much about you know out of his own bank account so it was like no no look we're just we're just good friends we just want to go in do a bit of photography um 
we promise we won't we're not doing this commercially and we weren't to be fair and we won't do anything with uh, you know we won't move stuff we'll leave it exactly where we are we won't tread where we're not allowed to tread or anything like that eventually they accepted this non-commercial studenty approach and let us in but it was by a whisker and all it was was the taxi driver trying to do us a favor to get us in free you know that's not something you can plan for so you you need to be <laughs> you need to be on your guard and, and ready to pull on a bit of charm from the first moment from the moment you wake um this photo actually was taken in this little alleyway in the um hotel well, it was an airbnb where we stayed um there was this ramshackle lift in this building and i absolutely loved it and i so and, and the model as well we so wanted to shoot it but there was a little lady sitting in this hallway and no amount of uh, charm and smiles and friendliness would get her uh, to give us permission to, to shoot in this lift because people are going up and down in it all the time they weren't um, but it needed to be accessible at all times and absolutely no way you were ever going to shoot in that so we decided well there's this little alleyway around the corner we'll shoot in there and I've done a little pull away shot as well as you can see this is what the alleyway looked like so it's not exactly pretty but that was again part of that challenge of doing something I haven't done before and ever since doing this I've done I've always looked for the dirty grimy places because I absolutely love the contrast of a beautiful wedding dress with the dirt and grime and, and my brides love it so why not next thing to talk about shoot diary oh my god if I can give you one piece of advice it's get a shoot diary doesn't have to be you know minute by minute breakdown but it is the be all and end all when you get there for you to look at how are you going to plan your time not saying i mean this particular shoot or this particular series of shoots as you can see was over five days but I, the, the the shoot i'm going to be talking about at swpp that was one day so we had almost no time and there were six setups we had to shoot completely different setups we ended up getting a lot more because we followed the schedule pretty much to a t in terms of the Rome shoot, you know, you've got to allow yourself time for recovery and, and a bit of rest. And you're not you don't want to be shooting 5 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. every day. And also think about your models. You know, it's respectful to them holding poses. It might be um, it might be hard for you to believe if you're a photographer and you've never tried to pose in which case do it stand in front of a mirror but holding poses is blooming hard work it is not easy and so you need to give your models that time to recover as well giving them that break giving yourself that break also gives you a chance to kind of step back a bit consider your options think about uh, whether you're happy with the location you're in are you happy with your current lighting setup you know your lens selection you're not going to be changing chopping and changing the idea is challenge yourself to stick to a light setup stick to a location stick to a lens and when you really feel that you've made the most and pulled out everything you can from it yeah, then you change but taking that break gives you that chance to really consider that um, we were shooting as you can see several days so what we actually did was i planned a few days where we had um well what we didn't want is we didn't want a late finish followed by an early start so you'll see the late finishes were then followed by a morning bar the first day where we had i put shoot minus that was literally just an hour and the idea behind that was just give ourselves an hour to kind of gel together and get used to working together out in the middle of somewhere none of us have really been um, so just a little quick and dirty shoot and I've got a couple of shots from that which I'll share a bit later um, what we also did is the bigger two hour slots that you see later in the uh, the week on the 19th of June that was actually Ostia Antica um, the late shoot on the 18th of June that was the Colosseum and surroundings and what I did was I basically decided those places that I know are going to be awesome I keep to later so that we've all warmed up and we know what we're doing and we feel like we're getting on rather than doing the potentially best locations first and not quite being in the zone yet um, the shoot plus that you see at the end of the week was literally just to take us into sunset so you'll see I made a note um, I had a, there's a hundred apps out there that tell you sunrise and sunset times in fact you can tell on your Apple watch these days I think probably most watches can but um, you can we made a note so that we would get a few days where we would shoot 
with sunrise in mind and with sunset in mind. The other thing I'll say is, um, because this was over several days, and I, I do it even where it's a single day shoot, start with, we've, I've put hotel there. What that meant was that was essentially an initial planning meeting, you know, a get together and, and just kind of trying out all the outfits, discussing our location plans, and then food shopping, because we actually stayed at a, a self-catering place. Uh, so this is a good example, actually, of where your shoot diary um, might not quite go to plan, but it does help you in planning when things don't go as you had originally scheduled them. So one evening we went out to do shoot um, around the Colosseum and surrounding areas around there. And those of you that have been to Rome will know that there's absolutely amazing variety of buildings. Um, and I didn't used to do an awful lot of slow exposure stuff. Um, for me, it was all about natural light or flash. Um, and when we were out and about, at, I don't know, two o'clock in the morning, we were ready to head back. We met this guy called Eddie, absolutely amazing guy, um, who was also a photography and travel enthusiast. Um, and he was actually out there doing slow exposure stuff. He wasn't doing slow exposure with, with lights or anything like that, but he made me think of, well, you know what, actually, why don't I do something like that? And rather than working with just flash, do a bit of slow exposure stuff. So this is actually um, slow exposure naturally naturally lit by, you know, the, the, the lamps that are around of the building. And then the bride in the image is actually lit and the stairway is lit using um, our phones, the flash or the torches on our phones. Um, but doing this and meeting this guy and anyone that's done slow exposure knows that it's not a one shot and done. You do, you know, you do several takes on it. Uh, we ended up finishing at 5 a.m. the next morning. And the plan was then to actually start at 8 a.m. the next day. That wasn't going to happen. But because we had the schedule and we knew where we were in terms of timings, we just literally shifted that shoot the, by three hours forwards so that we took up one of our break slots and instead pushed it earlier in the morning so that we had everyone got a bit of sleep because you can imagine models with bags on their under their eyes would not be good <laughs> so i talk a little bit about outfits um it was clear to us that you know as wedding photographers we were going to want wedding dresses but as I already said at the start i didn't want to spend five days in Rome just shooting weddings and doing wedding photography. So we wanted to do other stuff, fashiony stuff, grungy stuff, you know, just casual bystander, touristy type stuff. We wanted something different. And the problem with that is if you're traveling is that every outfit adds weight and packing space is taken up. And it's not just the dress or the suit you know you've got to think about jewelry you've got to think about shoes i mean every look might require completely different makeup and yes makeup doesn't take a lot of space but it can do when you've got 10 different shoots to plan for all of which need to have a different look especially when you're flying you've got very limited space so you do have to think very carefully about what you're packing and how you're packing it um where do we source our outfits well we sourced our outfits from ebay we went to tk maxx which for anyone that's listening from uh, outside the uk tk maxx is basically uh, cheap and cheerful pricing on uh, expensive brands uh, which is great for um well it's kind of like a all you can eat really um, when you find outfits and you go a bit mental with spending money in there anyway um, but it's a great place to find something totally different that you might not have considered otherwise because the outfits are kind of thrown into the aisles. Um, so it's very hard to find a gem, but equally, it's very easy to find something that you hadn't necessarily considered. Um, the models themselves had some outfits uh, and we were fortunate enough uh, that Rasheen here uh, was able to convince a amazing wedding dress designer called Inbal Draw, uh, who people may have heard of now because they are rumored to be supplying Meghan Markle's dress for her wedding to Prince Harry. Uh, and she convinced them to supply us with a couple of dresses um, and they were absolutely phenomenal. And I'm so grateful that we had the opportunity to, 
to shoot with these dresses because it gave us something uh you know quite clearly more high end than just a an ebay wedding dress so this is actually um the shot as we were about to head out i know it's not particularly greatly lit <laughs> this is just a iphone shot but what i wanted to show is really this is what we had to to take with us now um we had two models and there was myself and dasha all four of us um had uh, checked in baggage allowance but it was used up very quickly three of the cases uh, were purely outfits I mean one case in itself had just a wedding dress in it that dress you just saw it it packed down but it didn't pack down lightly so it was a single case devoted just to one outfit effectively and then another two cases just purely for shooting um, we then basically had our hand luggage Dasha and I shared one hand luggage for our clothing, not that you need much, you know, t-shirt, shorts, bit of underwear. <laughs> um, and the models then were able to take their hand luggage with their stuff. We had to give them some allowance, but obviously they had to accept that they would also need to carry their makeup, uh, anything that didn't fit in with the outfit suitcases. Uh, then aside from that, we just had um, a collapsible rucksack that you see there at the front on the left hand side at the very back comfy shoes you're going to be standing a lot make sure you have comfy shoes and then we had a pelly case with our camera gear which really you know the idea behind that was it was a hard case just in case we had to check it in with our luggage it would have meant our camera gear was protected i'm probably like a lot of other photographers i don't trust baggage handlers um not so much just because the way they throw stuff around but equally uh, the fact that stuff goes missing so i've got a peli 1510 the peli 1510 is a great roller case which um, as you'll see at the bottom of this slide as well it doubled up uh, as a safety deposit box when we were out and about so we everyone chucked their passports and wallets and stuff in there we locked it to the radiator in the apartment that we were staying and then at least we had some semblance of security uh, versus just hiding stuff under quilts or you know behind wardrobes and whatnot this is the camera gear that i brought with me um i know what was i thinking one camera body only um if i did it again i would bring two but it's worth pointing out that all this bar the tripod fit in that peli case um and it was a tight squeeze uh, so there really was no room or, or margins available to to take extra equipment so really the idea was you know what what am i going to take with me well actually it's worth pointing out that um i took a their last light easy box which is like a fold up uh soft box um, that we never used and the reason for that is because the five in one reflector we have we could actually shoot flash through that as a diffusion panel and that doubled up then as a as a large soft box had i not taken the easy box the space that takes up roughly equivalent with maybe two camera bodies so i could have taken an extra camera body this isn't something I knew at the time. It's something I know now. It has altered the way that I pack my gear when I go off to any shoot. What do you take? Well, obviously you take your camera. Clearly I'm going for portrait purposes. I'm gonna take a standard portrait lens. For me, that's 105 mil. I absolutely love my macro 105 mil. I now have a, the 105 1.4 and I absolutely love that as well. What has become clear to me is I love the 105 mil focal length. Um, so that was a, a no-brainer. I wanted to take a wide angle with me, the 14 to 24, not something I used commonly up until then. So that was me challenging myself. And then I took a telephoto, the 70 to 200, because that covered uh, a wide variety. I do have a 24 to 70, but I, I'm not particularly enamored with 24 to 70. I don't know what it is about it. Everybody's different. Everybody loves their particular set of lenses. Um, so what I did is I took a, a, a Nikon 50 mil 1.8. It's a tiny little thing. It fits in your pocket. And it meant that I had that middle ground covered in between uh, the, the wide angle and the telephoto. A couple of flashes because I'd have one for, you know, as my main light and another one for rim lighting potentially. Uh, the remotes that I used allow me to fire the flashes from 100 miles away, not quite 100 miles, but, you know, far enough that I was never going to worry about lighting. Um, 
And then the tripod I took, actually the Mi Photo uh, road trip, I absolutely love that tripod because what it does is it has a leg that you can take off that then doubles up as a monopod or indeed, as you can see there, a handheld boom arm that you can attach your flashes to, which is what we did quite a lot of the time. And yes, there are locations where the tripod wasn't acceptable, but there were locations where a monopod was acceptable, or indeed it was so small that I could just have it in my back backpack um, and pull it out and just raise up the flash a little bit higher when I needed to. Then the obvious memory cards, make sure you got plenty of them, batteries, chargers, remote controls, that kind of thing. So just showing you this shot here, um, this is an example of another sort of scenario that didn't quite go to plan. Rome is full of these amazing doorways, absolutely splendidly detailed and huge doorways. And um, there was two doorways in particular that we really, really liked. One turned out to be the entrance, the main entrance to um, <laughs> the local police station and we were very quickly shooed away by police, but not before him coming and seeing what the hell we're doing, because obviously there we are taking photos of a front door to a very secure area. Um, thankfully, because the model was dressed in what was clearly an outfit, I think he very quickly cottoned on, but he wasn't talking to us in English when he told us to move along, folks. <laughs> the other one that was quite interesting was that, um, I got shouted at by an angry nun. Um, we found this doorway which was quite elaborate and yes, in hindsight, it quite clearly was uh, the portal to a very <laughs> uh, sacred uh, place. But um, we set up this shot and we were just about to shoot when out of nowhere, this voice from above and you're thinking, oh, the heavens are speaking to us. And it was actually this little nun um, who was shouting, well, I don't know what she was shouting. It could have been profanities. It could have been uh, damning us to hell for all eternity. What I do know is that we very quickly moved on. And even as we were reaching the end of the road, she was still shouting at us. So, you know, be a bit attentive to, to people around you and what it is they do or don't want you to do. <laughs> So in terms of accommodation, I mentioned briefly, we actually went with uh, Airbnb. Um, you know, hotels can be quite costly, especially if you're booking in for yourself and a couple of models. And as I say, there was two of us, we could have shared a room ourselves and the models could have shared a room, but we also uh, were able to find an Airbnb that was very close to where we were gonna be doing a lot of our shooting. You don't want models in wedding dresses having to walk for miles and miles. Um, so having somewhere nearby was quite handy. It meant we didn't have to worry about taxis for far too many places. Um, it meant we didn't have to worry about cam camera gear having to be traipsed around everywhere. Um, and because we went for an Airbnb, we actually found somewhere that was big enough for the models to have their plus ones with them as well if they wanted to. Um, the other benefit was uh, in terms of sharing that apartment, because we shared the apartment, we were able to brainstorm together. You know, at the end of the day, at the start of the day, we were able to talk about what locations we were going to, um, how outfit combinations worked, um, as well as actually reviewing how had a particular day gone, what had gone well, what had not gone well. And it really helped to build camaraderie between us. And don't be mistaken, photography shouldn't be done just for the money. It really shouldn't. Photography should be a passion of yours. And passions should be shared. They should be shared amongst friends. They should be shared amongst people you've never met. And that builds friendships. And it should be shared as much as possible with everyone around you. Because that's what helps you to develop, not just as a photographer, but as a person too. I genuinely believe that. Um, and so actually, if you're sharing, uh, <laughs> an apartment in very close quarters for five days and it's this intense environment of shooting, you're very quickly going to build up a good relationship with each other. Oh my God, don't forget about food. Your models will not all um, be 
uh, willing to just drop to the nearest McDonald's. You know, they look great because quite often they eat great, they eat healthy. Some might have vegan diets, some might have vegetarian diets, some might have allergies that you don't know about. Find out in advance and research where you can go on the day so you can plan in advance what you're going to do. Some places like this shop, which was again at Austria Antica, there might not be that many food options, so you might need to bring something with you. Um, so the self-catering place that we stayed in, we actually on the first day went out, as I said, and bought food. Um, what we had decided was uh, in advance that we would pay for dinner for everybody out on the last night only. Beyond that, the food was provided in the apartment. But as we went out, everyone said, you know what, I'd much rather go out and see the city. I don't mind having to fend for myself as long as there's breakfast and lunch. So that's what we ended up doing. Uh, as it happens, uh, on one early morning shoot that we did, we ended up uh, finishing quite late. We started for sunrise and then finished, I don't know, about 9, 10 a.m. It went on a little bit longer than originally planned, but so we stopped on the way, walking back uh, with two models in wedding dresses through Rome. Uh, we stopped at a little quaint restaurant and had breakfast, and you can imagine the looks we had. <laughs> I mentioned briefly, uh, so, so some other things you need to think about. I mentioned briefly about food. Yes, obviously you need meals. You need to sort meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner. But think about other food as well, like snacks as you're moving around. Uh, drinks, particularly if you're in a hot place. I mean, fortunately, Rome has uh, free water fountains everywhere. So all you need to bring is a water bottle and you're, you, you know, you're safe. But do bear that in mind at all times that you're not just fending for yourself here. You need to think about your models and keep them happy and hydrated and <laughs> away from starvation as much as possible. Other things to think about. Be wary of pickpockets and thieves who absolutely love camera bags. If you can walk around with a, a bag that doesn't quite scream camera bag, that's great. And you saw very early on in my seminar here, I just talked about a webinar, I talked about, I had a little uh, rucksack. It wasn't a camera rucksack. It was just a collapsible little thing that would just fold up to a bum bag if we needed to. It didn't scream camera gear. We still nearly, very nearly had somebody try and nick all our gear when we were shooting around the Colosseum on this steep slope that you never would have thought people could climb um, but so you just it makes you very aware and suddenly it's like well you know what I'm not going to put my camera gear down I'm going to carry it now forevermore um, and so with that in mind that again hones in what gear you actually want to walk around with because you don't want to be carrying lots of heavy equipment all day um, this particular shot is a good example. This is actually from that first day of shooting. We went out. This is maybe 100 yards away from where we stayed. There was just this concrete block wall. And I just thought this would be so cool. I just want to do something with this. And so we just very quickly set up. Here's a behind the scenes shot. You've got Dasha there holding a flash. And this was a little pop up softbox. I'm afraid I, I don't remember the make. Uh, I think it might be a LumiQuest, but I'm not sure. Um, but it's just a little pop up softbox. Um, and then that fire to create that light that you see there, shooting in shade so that we didn't have to worry too much about overpowering the sun. Um, oh, I suppose I should ask at this point, Jay, is there any questions at this stage? Uh, we do have some questions for you, Jacob, but I've, we've been hanging on to them because they're kind of more general than anything specific. It's all about shooting abroad. OK. Um, so uh, okay. Wanna, uh, I think the easiest thing is if you crack on and I'll just hit you with them all in one in one hit then when you're ready, bud. Oh, my God. OK. It's not going to get too panicked. You've answered quite a lot as you've gone, so I've stripped them out. <laughs> so not, you know, it's not going to be epic, but we've got a few and they're good ones. So I, I, I like them. epic. There's nothing wrong with epic. So... Yeah, so a couple of other things to think about. It's very important that you pay attention to local customs. You know, where can you place your models? Is it okay for them to stand on that plinth? Um, are you okay to climb over that fence? Are you okay to clamber up on that wall for a bit of height because that's where you need to get the shot from? You know, these sort of things you can find out very quickly online. Uh, you know, rights around where you can and can't shoot particular buildings in London, like the Gherkin, I think it is, or Paris, you know, the Eiffel Tower at night. You've got to be careful about shooting places like that where you're planning on doing something commercial. Um, 
But even if it's not commercial, you're going to be out there with big camera equipment, with a model dressed up, you're going to look commercial. And it just isn't always worth the fight with somebody uh, explaining that what you're doing is not commercial, it's just for fun. So just be aware of that. Um, also, be very, very conscious of where your nearest hospital is. You might not need it. And thankfully, we never have. I say that. I'm wrong. We did need a hospital once, and that was actually on a paid shoot. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's another story for another day. Uh, but just be aware of your nearest facilities. One final note, just think about passers-by. You're shooting pretty people in pretty outfits in completely random locations. You will inevitably draw in curious members of the public that want to know more about what you're doing and why. Interact with them, you know, let them have a shot with the model. Why not? At the end of the day, being nice to those people, they might return the favor and say, oh, have you thought about going and shooting down this way? Have you thought about going over there? You know, and it might not be something that was in your original plans, but when you then go, you might be pleasantly surprised and find something totally new. That's pretty much it. I don't think I can fit much more in the time that I've got allocated. Suffice to say that I will be talking more about this at the uh, SWPP, but I'll leave it to Jay now to ping some questions my way if there are any. Absolutely, mate. Uh, but first of all, um, what a great insight. So thank you for that. I mean, you know, it is 40 minutes that you've done and you've, and you've you know, crammed a load of fantastic information in there. So uh, from me to you, in case I forget, thank you. But I'm not the only one thanking you. There's plenty of thanks coming through the chat panel already. Um, I'm not going to ask them in any particular order, bud. Uh, and there's not loads, so don't get too freaked out. Um, but uh, I thought they were really, uh, really uh, interesting questions as well. Uh, and uh, all the stuff about about kit and what you traveled with I knew you were going to cover it so I've stripped those out anyway but um, if anybody's got any more questions on that then please feel free to pop them in the question panel. Um, okay so I'm gonna uh, sum it up so obviously right back at the beginning you talked about planning you talked about looking at permissions and stuff in advance so for say this shoot in Rome how far in advance did you start actually doing the planning and contacting for permissions for shooting and so on? So the actual planning of the shoot um, started a year in advance. Um, what actually happened, I wasn't kidding when I said that Dasha and I wanted to go back and eat ice cream. Uh, genuinely, we, we came back from our first trip to Rome together and pretty much the, the day we landed, I turned to Dasha and said, I want to go back there. Um, and it didn't seem feasible financially for us to just go for no reason other than to eat ice cream. So we decided actually after a bit of toing and froing and talking to some colleagues in the photographic industry that actually um, maybe doing something with it like a, a photo shoot might be the way to go because then it would feel more productive and we'd still get the, the opportunity to go back there. So very early on, it was quite a long way in advance that we decided Equally, the models we got in touch with quite far in advance, because bear in mind that you need to book flights and the earlier you book flights, the better. Um, in terms of the locations, most of the locations we kind of knew, having been to Rome before, we kind of knew where we wanted to go. It took a while for me to put the shoot diary together and that was probably a fluid thing over a few months. But then, as I say, very late in the day, uh, a week and a half before we were due to fly out, I found out about this Ostia Antica place and absolutely had to shoot there. So that was one that was very last minute. And I guess in hindsight, um, I would have loved to have been able to do more there. Um, and I probably could have done if I had managed to arrange these permissions that suddenly I needed, which had I, when I spoke to the person over the phone and when I checked the website, wasn't necessary at all. But of course, planning it further in advance, they probably would have turned around and said, oh, I see what you're doing here. Yeah, no, actually, you do need permissions for that. And that might have been a bit better for us on the day. Do you, do you think in that instance, though, and I'm just judging it based on the experiences that I've encountered over here on shoots, that the minute that you go down that route, do you think it would have become uh, costly, though? Do you think you would have been paying for the, the, the permission to shoot there? Oh, absolutely. Hundreds of dollars yeah. uh, or euros, if you will. Um, it would have become a commercial embodiment of a shoot rather than a few friends having a laugh together. Uh, so it might well 
um, have completely killed that off as an idea, as a location to go to. Most of the shots that you saw here, apart from that, were just literally walking around and shooting. And I'd done my research as to permissions to shoot around Rome. There was a bit of uh, oohing and ahhing about whether you could or couldn't shoot generally. Um, but it, we decided, no, look, you can, as long as it isn't for commercial purposes. Once you go into commercial purposes, it's a bit like uh, in London, you suddenly need commercial licenses. And those licenses might be free or they might cost a bit of money, um, but it would have made it a lot more difficult. So, yeah, in you know, some of it is also the fact that because we were walking around with very little equipment, it meant that we could move on very quickly. If anybody turned around and said, no, no, you're not shooting there, such as the angry nun or or the police officer, and that obviously causes less problems if you're just willing to just up sticks and, and walk away. If you've got a load of gear with you, that might be more difficult. Absolutely. Um, I thought this was quite an interesting question, and it was one actually that I think you've kind of answered, but um, I, I thought about it as well, because obviously we've seen quite a variety of images from you tonight, obviously some that clearly you won't get unless you you know you go to these places but there are also there yeah. are images that you could capture here so the question actually came in was um, i've seen images that i could probably possibly get here so why why do i go to the extent of the travel the cost the expense yeah yeah no it's absolutely a valid question and the fact is that a lot of it yes you can and my takeaway was from it actually i know places where i can do this I didn't know that at the time, um, but it was like I said at the very start, it was pushing myself out of my comfort zone. I know a lot of places that I can go to locally, that I can go within the UK, and I can get these kinds of shots. I don't necessarily need to go to Rome for most of those shots, but I wouldn't have been as uncomfortable and I wouldn't have had to think on my feet as much if I went somewhere that I'm already familiar with. And as I say, this is now a year ago. We hadn't done a lot of fashiony or grungy kind of stuff up until then. Um, and I wanted to put myself in that uncomfortable zone because when you do a wedding, unless you visit a venue several times or you've shot at a venue before, then every day is a new day. And so this was me challenging myself, but within that reasonable safety net of having of not having a paying client and just being a client of my own. And I get that. And I was hoping that was the answer that you're going to give, because I'm sure it was, which was great. Because the other thing that I think is key is that, yeah, yeah, we can we can go and set these personal projects here or abroad. But when you've committed like you did to the costs and everything that's involved, you're not going to waste that opportunity, are you? Well, you clearly did. No. You know, you're going to go out there. You've invested in it. So, all right, it's a work in, maybe, you know, you might see it as a work in holiday. You're pushing yourself, you're doing something that you love, you're going somewhere that maybe, obviously, you've experienced before, but the models haven't. Um, so, I, you know, I just wanted to chip that in. You know, we, I do it, you know, uh, I don't do it like, like this. I'll go, I love travel and I love photographing and I, I don't really particularly enjoy shooting people, but I love architecture and, and places and I love recording my journeys. But my holidays are photography based holidays you know the photography plays a huge part in my break away from my norm and in the photography world so i get it but i also get the point that you know you're invested then and it makes you well you know we saw your itinerary so you didn't really sit still which is amazing uh, so no. i love that um, we had a couple of questions and of course we've talked tonight about obviously um you've done this as a personal project but a couple of and i don't know if you know the answer so if you don't just please just be honest but a few people asked about you know talking about visas and work permits and stuff like that it's obviously a completely different thing when you're talking about a commercial shoot than what you've talked about tonight yes it is it's not it's not that i don't know uh, but you've you've hit the nail on the head if you're going as a working photographer then invariably you're going to find you need work permits this was more about me shooting for myself. Yes, it was with paid models. Yes, I had uh, my working equipment with me, uh, but I did look into it. And as far as I was concerned in this case, it wasn't necessary, but that was purely because of where we were going, where we were shooting. There were places like, for example, um, in the center of Rome, there's a lot of churches. It's full of churches. Some of those churches were very clear that if you didn't have a permit to shoot there, you could not shoot there. And that, that was predominantly, as I understand it, to um, protect 
local business because obviously if you could not shoot there without a permit then the only people that were getting in there were local wedding photographers so yes it's definitely something you need to consider it is something we looked at it wasn't something that we found necessary for the purposes of what we were doing probably the place where we could have done with it um, would have been Ostia Antica but again as I say as, as you already pointed out it would have become a commercial shoot and then it would have been scratched off the list anyway uh, and perfect uh, exactly how I thought you'd answer and we've experienced it time after time with you know stuff we've been doing commercially for the photographer academy and you you know when we've traveled abroad shooting you, you've got to do exactly like Jacob said you've got to do your homework and just check where you're going one of the chaps actually in the question panel mentioned Dubai well I've never shot there but I know how strict it is over there so you know you must factor that in if you if it's a commercial shoot or even if it's you know for pleasure you still need to make sure you know what you've got to do because the last thing you want to do is end up in, you know, and in some cases, you know, I don't want to scare people, but it is prison, you know, so just, you know, it, it might just be a day in prison or a night in prison, but it's not worth the risk, you know, so just doing it's that. It's a lost shoot. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. No, it, it, absolutely. And uh, as I say, I mean, you know, little things like the Eiffel Tower lit up at night. The Eiffel Tower itself isn't isn't the issue. It's the lighting arrangement on the Eiffel Tower. Little things like that, if you don't do your research, can catch you out so easily. And the fact is that there's only so much you can talk your way out of something. Um, so if you haven't done your research and you end up shooting somewhere that has very clear restrictions on photography, you might well find, as you say, you're going to end up uh, spending the night somewhere other than your original hotel room. It, we were amazed. Just a quick story from us here at the Academy. It was going back to the very early days. We're talking about eight, nine years ago. Um, uh, Manfrotto and Astolite back then invited us out to New York to demonstrate for them. And they wanted us to make some uh, uh, some film uh, in New York for them. And of course, we're going to do it. And, you know, the, the money was there. The budgets were there. But it was for up to us to organize everything that we needed to organize. And it's the first time I'd ever experienced it while working for the company. And it was all laid on my desk. And I'm looking into work permits and tripods on the streets of New York and this, that and the other. And all of this stuff's coming up. Uh, on the internet and the, log the logistics we were classed as a film crew and not photographers and it, and it was just and then um, you know uh, I was speaking to, to Last the Light and they said I'll have a chat with our guy he, he deals with all of this um, and he took over from me but it turned out that we never had any grief at any point in New York ever while we were filming on the streets of Manhattan in Central Park um, we weren't in, you know, we weren't in the main, you know, the main roads, but we were in Central Park, we were in Manhattan, and we filmed for two days without any issues. And yet since I have had much more grief and problems shooting in the UK than I have had anywhere else in the world, like you said. Um, and we... Interestingly enough, the, the shoot that I, and I, I know I'm, I'm not senselessly plugging it, but the shoot that I will be showing at SWPP, that was one where I did have to get permission in advance, permits for access and for shooting, had to comply with a whole heap of regulations, had to do a, a health and safety risk assessment. And then despite doing all of that, jumping through all the hoops, filling in all the paperwork, paying all the fees, we still got challenged on the location on the day. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, as much as we can give you as much insight as possible, you know, guys, you've got to do your homework and just be prepared uh, and, and be prepared for it all. I thought this was quite an interesting question, Jacob, and obviously I don't think we touched on it tonight. Uh, but the question was actually about insurance uh, for your kit when working abroad. So, I mean, I know how I would answer that, but it'd be interesting to hear it, uh, how, you know, how your approach to it and what you took for your insurance on your kit. Um, my approach was quite simple. I have insurance in place for all my equipment when I go out to weddings and commercial shoots. I phoned up my insurers. I said what I wanted to do and I asked them whether I would be covered or not. As it happened, I was. Um, so it wasn't an issue. But very simple answer, really. Phone your insurers and find out. I would not have done this without having insurance in place. And that insurance covered me and the models. Perfect. I mean, most, I say, like, um, you know, indemnity, public, public liability. 
most of um i mean speaking for the photographer academy and obviously we talk about insurance quite a lot in there obviously we we have very specific uh business insurance for us being photographers and our insurance policy com covers us with no additional cost uh for working abroad in commercial or or, or, or uh you know on a on a personal project uh but obviously you know you yes check with your own insurance company don't just take it that it's covered on you know your normal travel insurance it is worth um you know speaking to the likes of tower gate or a duke uh, a dukey you know the the specialist in in the you know and you usually find that nine times out of ten is not not as expensive as you think and it's so important no, no um, so I mean, we're, we're, we're with i think they were called uh, click way back when and have been taken over by his cox perhaps i might yeah. be uh, misquoting but um, we because we shoot weddings abroad as well we do destination weddings we already had m made sure that we had coverage abroad but I still phone them up because as I say this was a personal project it wasn't attending a paying client um, and that was still covered under the policy but obviously worth checking but oh no absolutely perfect and i, and I said we would uh, debbie here would still check our insurance before we went anywhere um and to make sure but yeah we know it's part of it but we still always check you know every every time and make sure we've got it covered and if it's not you usually find that you know there's not much of a chance to have it increased or they possibly just add it anyway but they need to know so perfect i'm just quickly scouring them jacob we might actually be there mate i'm just making sure i haven't missed anything there's a few i've deleted uh, how do you manage finance required for non-commissioned product support do you Oh, well, that's an interesting question, but obviously you've talked about this being a personal project. Um, obviously, the question—I don't know if it—the um, question is, how do you, you know, I suppose it's saying, how did you factor in the cost? Because obviously they're yours. Uh, in this instance, yes. do you pre-sell or do you have any plans? You know, uh, do you have any? Uh, okay, so make sure I read it right. Even though this was a personal project, would you would you seek or think about making money from what you've done? Uh, with the shots does that make sense have i worded that I yes think? it does make sense um there's two answers to that question or there's there's two parts to the answer the first is that if i had looked at making use of the images it becomes a commercial shoot now that might not seem like an issue but there are places that we shot in italy uh Ostia antica being one of them where the venue could recognize that we had shot there and then come claiming that we had used the venue for commercial purposes, therefore we should be paying their commercial licensing fees. Uh, and you would have had a tough argument or bad publicity or both uh, if you didn't agree with that. So that restricted what we could do with these images um, for a start. Um, but the other thing was, yes, in terms of financing it, I didn't envisage that I was going to do particularly much with the images. It was more for myself to improve my photography. Um, I could have looked at it and some people do. Some people will attend workshops um, and take photos at, at those workshops and claim them to be uh, at an actual uh, wedding, for instance. It does happen. I've seen it, you know, and I'm sure you have as well, Jay. I don't agree with that kind of policy. I don't uh, hold myself out to be taking shots that I've shot at uh, a personal project or a, a workshop as being part of a paying client's job. Um, so really, this was for myself. And the financing purely came from, well, you've got to look at what you have available to you for training every year, rather than doing a lot of training courses that particular year, rather than buying a new lens that particular year. I spent the money on models. I spent the money on flying out. And to be fair, we picked Rome. It was actually cheaper doing this in Rome than it would have been in London. Food was cheaper. The flights with Ryanair was cheaper than the train tickets to London. Yeah. And the Airbnb cost us, I can't even remember, it was something like a uh, hundred pound a day for five people. Yeah. You know, try finding that in London for two people. Yeah. So it was actually also an element of we went to Rome because we could afford to do it versus the alternatives. Absolutely. And this is quite interesting. This has just popped up <laughs> in the in the question panel now, but I can answer it. Uh, doesn't the use of images in this presentation count as commercial? No, because I ain't paying Jacob. So he's not earning <laughs> any money from me. He's here after Wait, the goodness what? of his own heart. That's so. not <laughs> Sorry, but <laughs> I've just got out of that one. Otherwise, you know, we could have Italy on your case. So, uh, 
<laughs> but uh, when I do meet you, I'll buy you a drink. No, I suppose I'll. Oh, no, I've just got the topic. <laughs> As long as the Italian authorities aren't listening, they want they might want to claim part of that pint. <laughs> they will they will understand my my Welsh tones, mate. We're all good to be fair. <laughs> um, this is a good question, and we've answered it. I think to be honest, um, you know, can you use the images for your portfolio without breaching commercial permissions? Yes, of course you can. Um, you know, you're not making any money from it in this respect. Of course, you're going yeah. to use it for your portfolio. I mean, on a completely different note, I used to, well, Jacob doesn't know this, but the guys from the Academy know that I used to I used to shoot loads and loads of live music. And there was never any money in it, and I shot some really big bands, but I was allowed to use the images for my portfolio. I wasn't allowed to sell the images, apart from the people that I actually did them for, um, but I was allowed to use them, and as you know, people who've seen them on my site and stuff. But it is it is a grey area, so do be careful about what you're doing and how you're using the images. But obviously, the, the main goal is commit. There's so many images out there; it's very hard for them to police. But you've mentioned obviously the Eiffel Tower a couple of times, and of course, I you know I've been out to Paris, and it was one of the things that I wanted to photograph. Um, and it was before they would actually strip, you know, become tight on the rules and regulations of it. But you know, it's the same as going, I you know I went and it's the same as with Canary Wharf, you know, in, in London, you know, I wanted to do some nighttime architecture shots and they're on you like a ton of bricks, you know, so it's just, um, you know, being careful, but understanding what you can and can't do. Um, Jacob, that is us done, my friend. But before we go, um, we do need to talk about something that's happening in January. Uh, but before I forget, in case I forget, and the chat panel, thank you, thank you, thank you for tonight, mate. It's been a fantastic insight. I know we've already talked about um, having you back in the new year to look about lighting a bit more. And, um, and we've talked about uh, getting you involved in the magazine, which would be fantastic. <laughs>